Hey, Craig, Craig actually, over to you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this year's Pushkin House Book Prize Award. I'm Craig Kennedy, Chairman of the Board of Trustees at Pushkin House. This is our eighth annual Book Prize Award ceremony. It's the first time we're coming to you virtually. Uh, we miss seeing you in person and being able to talk about the books over a, a lovely dinner in a nice setting. But the advantage of this platform is that we are able to reach a much broader group of people. So perhaps next year we'll rejoin you for dinner. I'd like to start this evening with a fun fact. Uh, every year at Pushkin House, we have a long list of around 75 or 80 books uh, for the general public in English about Russia. It's a huge amount uh, to get through. And even for those of us who love reading about Russia, it would take us reading more than one a week to, to wade through all of those books. And so it's a great gift for us to have Andrew Jack, the administrative team at Pushkin House, and most importantly, our talented and hardworking group of, of panelists uh, and judges to wade through all those books for us and try and find some of the finest of this year's selection of works. It's also great to have an opportunity to learn more about the shortlisted authors who have brought such immense learning and passion to the, the works that they've brought to us this year. And finally, the book prize gives us an opportunity to all come together and talk about great ideas and just enjoy each other's uh, company. Uh, all of this, of course, is very much at the core of our charitable mission here at Pushkin House. For over 65 years, it's been a place where people can come together to explore Russia and all of its complexities, to engage in its rich tradition of culture and the arts, and to express divergent views in a tolerant setting. So explore, engage, express freely, come to Pushkin House. It's great to have you here this evening. And with that, I will, I will turn it over to the head of the book prize, Andrew Jack. Thanks very much, uh, Craig, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so many for, for joining us um, for this evening. As Craig said, of course, it is a very disruptive year in many ways. As we know, coronavirus means that unfortunately we can't meet in person. The judges had to unfortunately work, work remote from each other. Um, and we haven't been able to, as we normally would, invite you all along with our shortlisted authors and judges to a dinner. So no food, but plenty of food for thought and continue with this central mission of trying to bridge the cultures of the Anglo-Saxon English speaking world and the Russian speaking world by showcasing and rewarding the very best in writing of nonfiction about the Russian speaking environment. And this year has been no exception. We've had some extraordinary books. You may already have joined us for a number of events with the authors. Um, they're all here with us this evening, those on the shortlist. And it's been a, a superb shortlist, an incredibly varied uh, range of writing of all sorts across the full geography of Russia and its region, touching on the environment, on health, on history and politics and ideas through the different eras and culture as a core aspect and common theme. Um, so you're going to hear um, shortly through a video from past winners and from um, our judges and from our shortlisted authors who talk briefly about their books. And then I'll hand over to Sergei Plochy, a uh, former winner, of course, of the prize twice, and who's very kindly agreed to be the judge, uh, the chairman of the judges for this year to announce the winner live uh, in about 25 minutes time. Um, but a reminder, all of those shortlisted authors are already winners with incredibly fascinating, worthy books. And both shortlisted and winners from past years, as you'll now hear, uh, have seen great value in the prize. So let's now watch a little bit and hear from past winners and from our judges and authors. Winning the Pushkin Prize was an unforgettable day for me. It moved Russian art history out of the niche that so many people have shoved it into, into the mainstream, which is something I've wanted to do for years. It drives my career. But also it just 
opened up conversations in ways I had never dreamt because suddenly your work becomes accessible to much bigger audiences. It becomes part of interdisciplinary conversations. And someone said to me years ago, when you write a book, it's like raising a child and then having them head off into the wider world. They go off on their travels. And as my friend said, they don't call, they don't write. The book doesn't call or write. You don't really know how it's doing all the time. And suddenly with the Pushkin Prize, you know, the book did call and it did write because people got in touch and they told me how it was influencing their own thinking or how it was working alongside their work in a completely different discipline. And so to hear from all of those communities was absolutely amazing. It was a great privilege to be nominated for the Pushkin Book Prize last year for my book on events in 1983 and a little known Cold War scare in November of that year when the Soviet leadership believed they were about to come under a nuclear attack from the West and prepared a full-scale nuclear retaliation against the United States and Western Europe. The book didn't win, sadly, but I still felt like a winner, partly because the promotion around the prize brought the book to a broader readership uh, and new readers in the United Kingdom, but also because one of the judges particularly liked the book, was impressed by it, thought it told a new story, uh, and arranged for a Moscow publishing house to acquire the Russian rights. So in the last 12 months, the book has been translated into Russian and is just about to be published in Moscow. So I'm very grateful to the Pushkin Prize for the promotion uh, around the book, uh, and getting it to new readers. And I'm also very much looking forward to reading this year's winner. Just want to give my warmest congratulations to all of the authors who have been nominated for the Pushkin House Book Prize and shortlisted for it. Um, I remember that feeling is such a thrill uh, to be nominated in an incredible company with five other authors and such an amazing experience and honor to win. I think for me, um, winning the Bushkin House Prize, I brought a lot of amazing opportunities in terms of more talks, uh, more opportunities to travel and meet people, better book sales, uh, and certainly more publicity. But I think that the best part of winning the Pushkin House Prize, it was really just becoming part of the Pushkin House community, uh, getting to know the people there, uh, getting more and more acquainted with the incredible incredibly culturally vibrant uh, slate of activities that they constantly have going on. Um, for me, there's no better incentive to writing a second great book uh, than the opportunity to be back at the Pushkin House. So congratulations to all of the nominees for this year's prize. And uh, you are joining uh, not only an elite community, but an incredibly warm and friendly, welcoming community with the Pushkin House prize. So congratulations to all of you and best of luck. Hello everyone, my name is Serhii Plokhi. I am the chair of the jury for the 2020 Pushkin House Book Prize. As twice the recipient of the prize myself, in 2015 and then in 2019, I am truly honored to be announcing the winner of the 2020 prize this evening after months of deliberation with my fellow jury members. We had a difficult but exciting task, choosing from the best of the best, and we tried our best to choose excellent books and excellent authors. Before the winner announcement is made, it gives me a great pleasure to first introduce my fellow jurors, then the six 2020 nominated books and authors. Joining me on the jury this year, was Celestine Bolin, international New York Times columnist and professor of journalism at Science Po. Ten long months ago, um, I was asked to be a member of the jury for the Pushkin House Book Prize. I was here at the Dacha enjoying the last lazy days of summer. Ten months later, uh, on the eve of the award ceremony, I'm again at the Dacha, and yesterday we had the first snow of the season, Pierre Sneg, always a big day. So um, I was honored, I was uh, excited to be a member, to read all the books that Andrew said he would, we would be reading. 
but I was amazed when I found out that the short list was made up of 55 books, 55 candidate books that met the criteria of having been published in English in 2019 about Russian-related subjects. We all know that Russia is a rich and deep subject of study, but I 55 books in one year really kind of uh, astounded me. But um, having said that, it was really fun, um, more fun than I expected, and also um, uh, and I was impressed by many of the books, including many of those that didn't, the, didn't make the final list. Um, it was a kind of an exercise of a sort, reading many of them on my phone, <clears throat> but I managed to do that. And, uh, uh, and again, the, I think that the quality and the diversity, the range and the depth of the selection is testament once again to something we all know, which is that Russia is an endless source of interest and um, ripe for exploration. Um, we chose six books in the end, two biographies, as you know, two biographies, two environmental books, uh, one uh, set, set of short essays and a book about an Eisenstein film. Um, but the rest of the selection was equally varied and, and again, in some sometimes astonishing. Yulia Safronova, Associate Professor and Chair, Department of History of the European University at St. Petersburg University, Russia. For me, it was luck and great success to judge at the 2020 Pushkin Prize. It's important to know that there are so many good non-fiction books about Russia. The most challenging work was to choose the winner. The 2020 prize attracts readers' attention to various aspects of Russia history and contemporary life and makes Russia more understandable to people all around the world. Richard Wright, former EU ambassador to the Russian Federation and director of the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees. I was very pleased to be asked to be a judge for this year's uh, Pushkin House Nonfiction Book Prize for, for 2020, an extremely interesting and enriching experience. We have had before us in our shortlist six wonderful books covering all aspects of Russia uh, and Soviet Union. All of these books have been marvellously well researched, they're fascinating to read, and they also bring to light um, something I think that everyone interested in Russia uh, would, uh, would agree with, namely our endless search for uh, more and more knowledge about the country, about its culture, its politics, its economics, its social condition, its environment, uh, 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 amongst other things. So let me conclude by uh, encouraging all patrons of the Pushkin House to uh, dip into some of these books and indeed others that we also looked at. They're marvellous reads and uh, I think, uh, like me, you will learn a lot from reading them. So I wish you a good reading. A Sivo Dobrovo. My jury colleagues and I looked at dozens of excellent books written about Russia, the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet space. And we selected six that we believe really represent a wealth of knowledge about the region. The books were all published within 2019, but years and years of work went into them. They combine scholarly rigor with engaging writing style, raise important questions, and bring to the reader numerous and often unexpected insights into the history, culture, politics, and the matters that matter today the most. I will list the books in alphabetical order and the authors will give you a brief introduction to their work. Brian Beck, Stalin's scribe, the life of Mikhail Sholokhov. I'm very honored to be a finalist for the Pushkin Prize. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about my book, Stalin's Scribe, 
which is a biography of Mikhail Sholokhov, one of the Soviet Union's most controversial and fascinating figures. Uh, while it's a political biography, it's also the story of a contradictory epoch, that is the Stalin era and the era of de-Stalinization, as well as the story of one of the 20th century's greatest novels. The book chronicles how Sholokhov's candor confronted Stalin, the dictator, um, with the consequences of such uh, policies as collectivization, as well as the Great Terror, and also chronicles Sholokhov's long, slow, painful decline into alcoholism and irrelevance. I present a new story of Sholokhov's life, and I started by assuming that Sholokhov's Soviet-era biography is a tangled web of legends, half-truths, um, fictional concoctions, and a web of contradictions. So I started from scratch and critically uh, reappraised everything that Sholokhov wrote and everything that was written about him by his close associates. Uh, the book attempts to answer a number of large questions, uh, both about the Stalin era, as well as about Sholokhov's biography. Why was a novel about the Cossacks that started to be published with great fanfare in the 1920s not completed until the eve of the Second World War? What motivated Stalin to save Sholokhov during the Great Terror? And the fact that Sholokhov is in the tiniest subset of the Soviet population, that minuscule group of people who were saved by Stalin rather than mechanically moved towards death with the stroke of his pen was something that intrigued me. How come Sholokhov was never able to once again match his creative prowess under Stalin? Did he plagiarize the great novel Tichy Don, Quiet Don, as Solzhenitsyn and others claimed um, in the early 1970s? And was Sholokhov the greatest con man of the 20th century? I think the book provides definitive answers to these questions and more. Kate Brown's book, Manual for Survival, a Chernobyl Guide to the Future. My book, Manual for Survival, is about the Chernobyl accident. I wanted to know how many people died, how many people got sick, what were the environmental impacts. So I went to the archives and I found a shocking story. Right after the accident, 44,000 people were hospitalized with Chernobyl exposures, 11,000 were children. In the years that followed, frequencies of disease grew and grew in five major disease categories. Kids got thyroid cancer. Adults and children had leukemia. Finally, in 1989, Belarus, Belarus said, we have a public health disaster on our hands and we need aid. UN agencies came in and said, we don't see a problem. I went to the UN myself because I was curious what happened. How did a story of this magnitude slip beneath the radar? And what I found is at the end of the Cold War, all kinds of people were suing their governments in France, Great Britain, the United States, and Russia for their own exposures to radioactive contaminants from the testing and production of nuclear weapons. But if international experts could say, look, Chernobyl, world's worst nuclear accident, and only 33 people died, then those liabilities could go away. And that's indeed what happened. The Siba Damth Floating Coast, an environmental history of the Bering Strait. Hello, I'm Beth Siba Damth, and I'm the author of The Floating Coast, which is a history of the Russian and American sides of the Bering Strait, which is where Alaska and Siberia almost meet. But the origins of this book actually go back long before I ever imagined being a historian. When I was 18, I moved to an indigenous Gwich'in village in the Canadian Arctic, about 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And I planned on staying there for like three or four months. Um, and I ended up staying there for several years. And my primary job was training sled dogs, and I really just sort of couldn't get enough of it. But to do that job and to not die, my host family had to teach me how to pay attention to the non-human world, um, how to imagine my actions from the perspective of the animals and the landscapes that, um, that I lived with. So much of my uh, sort of personal history in the place was defined by caribou or moose or the weather or the actions of my, my sled dogs. And this really changed the way that I, as a girl from Iowa, thought about things. Living in such a challenging environment left me thinking about two kind of interlocking questions ever since, which is um, how do our ideas change nature and how does nature change the way that we think about the world? And I wrote The Floating Coast really to examine these two ideas. 
and it takes place in the, the Bering Strait region because over the last 200 years, uh, this place has been home to so many different ideas. There are those held by the indigenous peoples of, uh, of the Bering Strait, the Inupiat, the Yupik, and the Chukchi, and then there's capitalism and communism that come in in the 20th century. And my hope with this book is that it lends readers a way of seeing the world and the past, kind of doing so through the perspective of whales and caribou and foxes, but also through the perspectives of many different kinds of people, as sort of a historical guide to ways that we can imagine our relationship with environments in the present, um, from uh, changing climates to melting ice. Owen Matthews, an impeccable spy. Richard Zorge, Stalin's master agent. Thank you so much to Pushkin House for considering an impeccable spy for the Pushkin House Prize uh, this year. Um, I wrote the story of Richard Zorge because, as many of you Russianists know, he's very well known, very famous in Russia and was lionized in the Soviet Union, but uh, is not so well known in the West. And uh, Richard Zorge was not only the most important and one of the most effective spies of the 20th century, but also a uh, very conflicted, a very difficult and uh, I think rather bad man who became a great spy. Perhaps those two things are inevitably linked. But his great um, tragedy and the tragedy of the book is that it's really a story of betrayal, not just a man um, who consistently betrayed everyone around him, as Richard Zorge did for all of the years of his espionage career. There was not a single human being who surrounded Richard Zorge, either in Japan, where he worked as a Soviet spy, neither in uh, Shanghai, where he worked earlier, uh, to whom he actually told the truth. He was a serial deceiver, and I think he uh, had a pathological compulsion to do that, in the same way as Kim Philby, I think, had a pathological compulsion to lie and deceive. Uh, but uh, it's also a story of the betrayal of Richard Zorge by his masters in Moscow, whom he served brilliantly and loyally for many years, and who, in the atmosphere of paranoia that engulfed Soviet intelligence in the 1930s, uh, stopped believing the fantastic intelligence that Richard Zorge uh, provided them. And the one thing that I've done, I think, uh, that's new in this book is actually uh, to use Soviet archives um, to uh, show exactly how and the mechanisms by which the trust in the Soviet Union's extensive intelligence agency was completely undermined and corrupted by the uh, atmosphere of paranoia that was engendered by the purges. And Richard Zorge ultimately fell victim to it and was abandoned and traduced by his masters. So uh, I very much hope that uh, you enjoy the book. Sergei Medvedev's The Return of Russian Leviathan Hello, I'm Sergei Medvedev, and I would like to present my book, The Return of the Russian Leviathan. It was born out of three feelings, and the first is the feeling of astonishment and awe of how quickly my country has transformed from what we thought was a normal state into a caricature of the Soviet Union, occupying neighbors, spreading threats, propaganda, and poison all over the world. So I found myself uh, trapped in the old edition of the Soviet Union, in my Soviet childhood, with uh, no free speech, no free elections, all pervasive KGB, and one ruler for life. So this is really a science of subtraction, seeing your country being taken away from you bit by bit, piece by piece. So in the end, I may ask, like Michael Moore once did ask of the president, where's my country, dude? So I'm asking the same question in these essays. Where is my country? The second feeling is that of a guilty pleasure of a historian. I teach political history, and it's really amazing to see how Russia's political history of the past 500 years has replayed itself in the past 20 years. All the patterns that were there the patterns of distribution of resources, power, of uh, making a society of states, of humbling the population. So they all have replayed themselves in the past 20 years. And this is really instructive. And the third feeling is that of humor. Because tragic as it is, 
this evolution, or rather devolution of Russia, is above all comical. All these Cossacks, bikers, generals, priests, a small man at the top with an inferiority complex yet displaying global ambition, a former empire which is dreaming of its past glory. This is above all comical. So this book is really between tragedy, history and humor. Welcome to the world of the Russian Leviathan. John Newberger's book, The Thin of Darkness, Einstein's Ivan the Terrible in Stalin's Russia. As scholars, we tend to study the cruel and destructive things that human beings do. But I think it's just as important to understand the ways that we cope with disaster. And making art is one of the greatest things that we do. Art sustains us, it helps explain the world around us, and it helps us deal with our feelings about what's going on outside of us and inside of us. My book is about the great Soviet filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein, making his masterpiece, Ivan the Terrible, commissioned by Stalin and during World War II. Ivan is far from an obscure movie, but it's never been given the kind of polyphonic treatment that I give it here. And that allows me to show the connections between aesthetics and politics, history and psychology, anthropology, and the making of art. And the book is really about the way two things come together. Eisenstein's ideas about reaching uh, audiences in new ways and making them see the world in new ways. And that's, and, and, uh, that's intertwined with Eisenstein's really rather profound ideas about the big questions of Russian history, the cycles of violence, revolution, ideology, sexuality, trauma, fathers and sons, um, and what makes rulers and really all of us respond to events the way that we do. The 2020 shortlist is exceptionally good, and I hope you will have a chance to really appreciate the depth of knowledge and insight that they offer. Pre-recorded, and we'll go very, very shortly back to him to announce the winner. But as you saw there, an extraordinarily rich and varied range of books that really fulfills the objective of what the house is trying to do with this book prize to capture Russia in all its variety. And the stakes are higher than ever this year because thanks to the generous support of our backers, uh, Douglas and uh, Stephanie uh, Smith and the Polanski Foundation, the prize money has been increased to 10,000 pounds. So now let me hand over to Sergei to announce the winner. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm appearing finally live. I'm amazed how good my iPhone turned out to be. The, the recording was not too bad. So it's, it's really my pleasure and my honor to announce, uh, to announce this year's winner. But I want to start with congratulations to all nominees for the Pushkin Prize. Uh, all the books uh, are exceptionally well researched and wonderfully written. And we had a very difficult task when we were uh, discussing of which one of those books, each of them is worth of winning, should be put at, at the very top. We managed to stay on speaking terms and even friends and still we arrived, we arrived to our conclusion. So the uh, prize, this wonderful prize goes this year to Sergei Medvedev for his book, the return of the Russian Leviathan. I hope that I, I don't pronounce, mispronounce again uh, the, the, the name of the book. The book is a collection of essays, as we just learned, but each chapter in that book worth many books. It brings together a range of disciplines and approaches to place the politics of today's Russian leadership in the long running continuum of Russian history culture, and mentality. Sergei Medvedev is not just a first-rate scholar and painter. He's also a talented and wonderful writer. And it's really my pleasure to congratulate him on behalf of 
the jury on behalf of everyone involved in this process with this great achievement and wonderful award. Congratulations. Well, th thank you. I'm. Uh, uh, I think it's 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 my turn now. Is it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm really uh, surprised and astonished and uh, left speechless at this point. Um, sorry, I just switched it up. And uh, uh, well, it's a uh, it's a huge privilege, and uh, especially in this uh, list of uh, amazing books. As I was now listening uh, to the book introductions, I uh, look forward to reading all of them. And each has a very uh, personal sound to me, uh, especially, for instance, you know, the book on the Bering Straits, because I also lived in Chukotka on the other side on the Bering Straits for also a couple of years uh, looking at the life of the indigenous peoples. So this is, first of all, um, I'm really proud to be winning uh, in such a wonderful selection of books, of texts. And uh, of course, thank you to the Pushkin House and to the jury and um, to the uh, their idea. It's, uh, you know, for a Russian, it's a, a special privilege to receive a prize of the name of, with the name of Pushkin, because, you know, for us, it's something like Shakespeare for the English speaking world. And um, uh, yet uh, there is also a secret feeling that Pushkin is somewhat yet, you know, too domestic and, uh, you know, really known to Russians, not known enough to the outside world. So this is really a very big recognition um, that the name of Pushkin is attached to such an uh, international prize. And uh, we especially like Pushkin for his, uh, not only he is the inventor, so to say, of the Russian literary language, uh, the first Russian professional writer uh, and poet, so to say, um, uh, but also he is a very keen stylist. So for me, this is a special pleasure to be, uh, you know, somewhat like a recognition of uh, the stylistic achievement of the book, because really for me, this matters a lot. Um, I really care a lot about words, which I select for this. So, uh, so thank you all. I'm, um, I'm surprised, I'm astonished, I'm flattered. I'm uh, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely happy to be receiving this prize and uh, I only wish uh, that uh, next year's uh, ceremony will uh, go uh, offline and uh, we'll all be able and the future uh, nominees will be able uh, to see and meet in person and uh, talk to each other uh, offline. So thank you all. So Sergei, thank you, thank you very much. And maybe just briefly, I'll turn back to Sergei Plochi um, for any final uh, reflections on the on the book. Uh, well, I, I don't have uh, any any reflections except that I want to say that again, if you're looking for one book that can help you to understand today's Russia, we certainly recommend. Uh, Sergei's book as, as that kind of a book on, on contemporary Russia and contemporary challenges. Uh, I wanted, I don't know whether we are at that stage or not, but I guess this is my last chance to do that. I really it want to thank, to thank my colleagues and, and, and the authors and uh, everyone at the Pushkin uh, House Press and, and particularly you for all the work, all the dedication, Craig as well, for everything that you are doing for that for that wonderful initiative and that wonderful award. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So Sergei, thank you, thank you very much indeed. And warmest congratulations to Sergei Medvedev. It sounds from your phone, Sergei, as though somebody knew before the rest of us did what the uh, outcome was going to be. No, I, I typed, uh, no, this is actually what my mother calling. So I typed, <laughs> uh, you know, she, she called back, but you know. Okay. To congratulate you, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And I would, I, I mean, I would just stress, um, you know, this is actually incredibly symbolic, actually, as a year, because Sergei is actually um, the first example of a winner in the Pushkin Prize in its eight years thus far of history to be himself a Russian based in Russia, and indeed whose original works on which this book were based were written in Russian. So it really encapsulates the um, spirit of the prize in bridging uh, our different cultures and languages and contexts. And equally, I have to say and praise um, another person who's here with us this evening, Stephen Diel, who was Sergei Medvedev's translator, because of course, translators play an absolutely critical 
role in distilling, summarizing, translating um, texts to make them compelling. And the English language version, which is the one that the judges are assessing, um, was very superbly done. So congratulations also to Stephen and to your role as a representative of translators in general. Um, may, may, may I just add a word? Uh, Please. Just, you know, Please. Yeah, of course, because I was uh, so taken away. Uh, but, you know, yes, of course, uh, Stephen is here and I'm happy, I was happy to see him and, you know, chat a little bit, uh, you know, in a private chat. Uh, yes, he's indeed, I would say, a co-author of the English edition of the book. And I was really amazed at the diligence uh, and the thoroughness with which he worked on the translation. It took indeed many months. So we were, you know, talking about, you know, individual words, explaining notions. He made, you know, hundreds of footnotes uh, to everything. So I was really amazed by his effort to translate, to transfer this to the English speaking reader. So thank you, Stephen. It's your prize as well. So, so thank you, Sergei. Um, congratulations to you both. Um, but really also passionately congratulations to all six of our shortlisted authors here, as I say, and it really isn't, um, you know, kind of anything but with full sincerity that I and the judges, I think, say how very tough it was to, to assess and to ultimately come out with a single winner because all six of them really do deserve uh, your reading pleasure in the months ahead for those who haven't yet done so and do please encourage friends and others to read them uh, within your networks. Um, so I'd like to now really thank the judges for all their incredibly hard work you heard from them and how much effort was involved and how difficult it was and it's great that even without the personal physical contact this year that we would normally have um, they were able to coordinate and ultimately come to this consensus. Um, thanks again also to our funders Douglas and Stephanie Ellis Smith and the Polanski Foundation for all their work. Thank you to above all Becky and Rafi and the Pushkin House staff who've kept Pushkin House going and so active virtually in these difficult COVID era times, um, to the video team and all those else who helped support this. Um, and thank you all, everyone who's watching um, for your continued support of Pushkin House. And keep, uh, keep watching because soon we'll be announcing another extraordinary selection of jurors as we kick off the fresh cycle for the Pushkin House prize of the coming year. So thanks again, happy reading and back over to Craig to conclude our event. So there you have it, another superbly curated list of current books about Russia. If you've been watching this this evening, it's probably because you value intelligent, insightful writing about Russia. Pushkin House is dedicated to high quality programming such as this. And to produce it, we depend on the generosity of members of our community like you. So if you've enjoyed this evening, if you'd enjoyed all the associated production as well, the online web interviews with various authors and other events that we've been holding, please consider making a donation to Pushkin House. Thank you again for joining us this evening and enjoy the books.